Book four, chapter two, part four of the History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume two, by Henry Charles Lee. Book four, Organization, Chapter two, Part four, The Tribunal. The most laborious work imposed on the inquisitors was the visitation of their districts. These were large usually embracing several bishoprics and when the tribunals became sedentary the necessity was apparent of a closer watch over aberrations than could be exercised from a fixed centre already in the instructions of fourteen ninety eight a system of visitation termed the general inquisition is seen at work and in fifteen hundred Datha ordered the inquisitors to visit all places where an inquest had not been held each inquisitor was to travel with a notary receiving denunciations and taking testimony so that on his return the colleagues could consult together and order such arrests as might be found necessary in districts where such visitations had already been made one of the inquisitors was ordered to travel every year holding inquests in the towns and villages and publishing the edict of faith to attract denunciations the other inquisitor remained in the tribunal to dispatch routine business or if there were none such he too was ordered to take the road reports in detail of the work accomplished in the visitation were to be made to the inquisitor general this remained the basis of the system and the instructions of fifteen sixty one merely define more clearly the functions of the visiting inquisitor who was told that he was not to make arrest unless there were danger of flight but was only to gather testimony and carry it to the tribunal for action if he made an arrest he was not to try the accused but to send him to the secret prison trifling cases however he could dispatch on the spot taking care that he bore delegated powers from the ordinary for that purpose the importance attached to these visitations is apparent when during the siege of toledo in the comunidades cardinal adrian and the constable and admiral of castile joined in an order november third fifteen twenty one to the commanders of the besieging forces to allow the inquisitors to come out and perform their accustomed visits in fifteen seventeen these visits were ordered to be made every four months each inquisitor taking his turn under pain of forfeiting a year's salary this indicates that the duty was distasteful and likely to be shirked and in fifteen eighty one the obligation was reduced to once a year starting at the end of january and taking such portions of the district as were deemed to require special attention in sixteen o seven the districts were ordered to be laid out in circuits to be visited in turn until all were covered when the process began anew in fifteen sixty nine an elaborate code of instructions was framed by which it appears that the principal objects were the publication of the edict of faith with its consequent crop of denunciations an investigation into the character and conduct of commissioners and familiars and the maintenance in the churches of the san benitos of those punished by the inquisition for which purpose the visitor carried lists for all the places to be visited a certain amount of stateliness and ceremony attended the visit before reaching a town word was sent forward of the hour of expected arrival when the authorities the church dignitaries and the principal gentlemen of the place were summoned to go forth to meet the inquisitor and escort him to his lodgings the secretary was instructed to note the details of these receptions whether honorable or otherwise the character of the lodgings provided and utensils furnished lack of respect on these occasions was punishable in fifteen sixty four dr thurita visiting the seas of gerona and elne found the gates of castellon de empurias closed against him and one of the guards seized his horse's reins he proceeded to prosecute the local authorities when the consuls proved that they were not in fault but two guards salvador Llop and juan maraña were sent to barcelona for trial although occasionally nests of morisco and jewish apostates were discovered in these visits as a rule the practical results appear to have been rather the gratification of old grudges by neighbors in little towns and the gathering in of fines by the inquisitors in fifteen eighty two juan aymar inquisitor of barcelona in reporting a visitation of the seas of gerona and elne and part of barcelona and vich makes parade of having published the edict of faith in two hundred sixty three places but he brought in only seven trivial cases of which four were of frenchmen these trips involved no little labor and even hardship four months was the time prescribed for them commencing early in february and the vernal equinox was not likely to be agreeable especially in mountainous districts naturally the duty was shirked whenever practicable and the effort of the suprema to compel its performance was endless in fifteen fifty seven it instructed the receiver at saragossa that each inquisitor on alternate years must spend at least four months in visitations and that this performance is an absolute condition precedent to his receiving the customary ayuda de costa 
This was carried even further in a carta acordada of January 25th, 1607, to all the tribunals. The inquisitor, in his turn, must start on the first Sunday in Lent, without attempting an excuse or a reply, and the report of his visit must be included in the annual statement of cases, for otherwise the ayuda de costa will be withheld from the whole tribunal, because these visits are the principal reason of its bestowal. This solidarity enforced on all the officials was possibly owing to the recalcitrance of subordinates, for in 1598 we find a tribunal asking the Suprema to issue the necessary orders to them direct, which it obligingly did, while remonstrating that it should not be burdened with such details. Throughout the 17th century, the correspondence of the Suprema with the tribunals of Valencia and Barcelona is filled with orders to the Inquisitor whose turn it is to go and refusals to accept excuses, and in 1705 a letter to Valencia asks why the visit had been neglected. When there were three inquisitors, the absence of one did not interfere with current business, but where there were only two it was a serious impediment. From the beginning the rule was absolute that two must act conjointly in all important matters, such as sentencing to torture, ordering publication of evidence, or rendering final sentence, and this in both civil and criminal actions. Minor and trivial cases, however, could be dispatched by one in the absence of his colleague, and he could continue to hold audiences and gather testimony while in the habitually leisurely transaction of inquisitorial business procrastination caused by the crippling of the tribunal for four months in every year was evidently not regarded as of any moment in the little tribunal of majorca however which could support but a single inquisitor he was deemed competent to act by himself and he probably was excused from visitations next in importance to the inquisitors stood the promotor fiscal or prosecuting officer in the original inquisition of the thirteenth century there was no such officer there was candor in the position of the inquisitor as both judge and prosecutor infinitely preferable to the hypocrisy that the trial was an action between a prosecutor and an accused with the inquisitor as an impartial judge how this came to pass will be considered hereafter we have seen that even in the skeletal organization of the first tribunal in fourteen eighty a fiscal was deemed essential he ranked next to the inquisitors and in fourteen eighty four it was ordered that he should assist in all public functions after the inquisitors and ordinary but before the judge of confiscations yet he was a subordinate in the regulation of salaries in fourteen ninety eight the inquisitors received sixty thousand marabedis the receiver the same while the fiscal was rated at forty thousand the same as the notaries and even the messenger had twenty thousand so in the sicilian tribunal in fifteen hundred the inquisitors and receiver have six thousand sueldos while the fiscal and notaries have only two thousand five hundred it was the same with the ayuda de costa in fifteen forty we find the fiscal allowed only the same as the notaries and alguacil and when in fifteen fifty seven the scale was fixed for saragossa the fiscal was portioned with one thousand sueldos and the inquisitors with three thousand the fiscal was held to act wholly under orders from the inquisitors in the instructions of fourteen eighty four they are represented as ordering him to accuse the contumacy of fugitives and to denounce the dead against whom they find evidence so in a trial of fifteen twenty eight we find the inquisitors ordering the fiscal to present his accusation against the defendant in fifteen sixty one among his duties was prescribed that of keeping the secreto clean and in good order he opened and closed its door with his own hands and in fifteen seventy he was required to have all the multitudinous documents well arranged sewed covered and so marked that they could readily be had when wanted the letters and instructions of the suprema were placed in his hands and it was his duty to give in writing to each official such portion as apply to him in sixteen thirty two there was added to his labors that of furnishing the suprema a monthly report embracing every pending case with a summary of all that had been done in it since the beginning a duty apparently not relished for the order had to be repeated in sixteen thirty nine with all these somewhat multifarious duties we never hear of a fiscal having a clerk, assistant, or deputy. In 1582 it was prescribed that his seat in the audience chamber was to be smaller than those of the inquisitors, placed to one side and without cushions. In public functions his chair was to be similar to theirs except that it had no cushion. The inquisitors were required to address him and the judge of confiscations as merced, and when he entered, they were not obliged to rise but merely to raise their caps. The position of the fiscal gradually improved. In his instructions of 1595 to Manrique de Lara, Philip II couples him with the Inquisitor, in requiring both to be in orders, and prescribes great care in the appointment for it is customary to promote fiscals to the Inquisitorship. Similarly, Philip III in 1608 
requires both offices to be filled by jurists and when in 1632 and 1637 the suprema made holy orders a condition it included fiscals with inquisitors the assimilation between the offices was rapid and in 1647 in a payment of ayuda de costa in valencia there occurs an item of thirty thousand marabedis to inquisitor antonio de ayala y berganza quote, por la plaza de fiscal unquote, showing that he was acting as fiscal the idea of coalescence was becoming familiar when in sixteen fifty eight gregorio cid after six years service as inquisitor of sardinia was transferred to cuenca he suggested that there ought to be there two inquisitors and a fiscal or at least that the junior inquisitor should serve also as fiscal the identification of the offices was facilitated in sixteen sixty by a royal cedula prescribing that fiscals were to be held the equals of inquisitors in precedence and honors canopies cushions and the like as well as in pay and emoluments thenceforth the office of fiscal came to be filled by one of the inquisitors though he took care to preserve his dignity by styling himself quote, inquisidor fiscal unquote, or quote, the inquisitor who performs the office of fiscal unquote. Thus at length the two offices coalesced, and we have seen in the table of officials in 1746 that they were reckoned together. As a matter of course, the inquisitor who acted as prosecutor did not enter the consulta de fe, and vote on the fate of the accused whom he had prosecuted. Sometimes, when there was no fiscal and no inquisitor willing to perform the duties, the senior secretary assumed the function. Such a case occurs as early as 1655, and it continued occasionally to the end. The notaries or secretaries formed an important part of the tribunal. They reduced to writing all the voluminous proceedings of the trials, all the audiences given to the accused with the interrogatories and answers, all the evidence of the witnesses and its ratification, the endless repetitions in the cumbrous and involved system of procedure which developed until the object seemed to be to protract business beyond the limits of human endurance. They kept the records which required an elaborate system of indexing so that the name of any culprit and his genealogy could be found whenever wanted in the later period moreover when the tribunals communicated to each other all their acts the correspondence served to fill the gap arising from diminished business at the beginning they were forbidden to employ clerks and were required to write everything with their own hands and this seems to have continued to the last in the earlier period they were styled notaries and sometimes escribanos or scriveners possibly because as such their attestation authenticated all papers. Early in the seventeenth century the title gradually changed to secretaries, an innovation to which a writer in 1623 objects, as not distinguishing them from the secretaries of magnates and cities. This objection did not prevail, and a document of 1638 uses the terms as convertible, although an order of the Suprema, in the same year, forbids notaries to be called secretaries, while in 1648 we find the new appellation firmly established. The importance of the office is shown by its fairly liberal salary. In the instructions of 1498, it is placed at 30,000 marabedis, one half of that of the inquisitors, though the proportion diminished in time, for we have seen that, in 1746, the secretary received 2,352 reales, while the inquisitor had 7,352. There was compensation for this, however, in the heavy fees accruing to the secretaries from applicants for proofs of limpieza a business shared with a new official known as quote, secretario de actos positivos unquote. the number moreover had greatly increased for while at the early period with its heavy work a tribunal was allowed but two notaries in the later time there were often four or five salaried secretaries to whom were sometimes added honorary secretaries with entrance to the secreto and honorary secretaries without entrance there was also a notary of sequestrations whose duties were highly important in the early times of abundant confiscations. He was always present when arrests were made, so as to draw up on the spot an inventory of the property seized. But as confiscations diminished, the office became superfluous and was suppressed by a carta acordada of December 1, 1634. After this we hear of a superintendent of sequestrations in 1647, and subsequently its occasional duties were discharged by some other official for a moderate compensation as in sixteen seventy in valencia the procurator of the fisc received twenty five thousand libras a year for attending to them the alguacil was the executive officer of the tribunal in the early lists of salaries his pay is the same as or even larger than that of the inquisitors but this was because the prison was at his charge from this he was relieved in fifteen fifteen by ferdinand who empowered the inquisitors to appoint carceleros 
at a salary of five hundred sueldos after which the wages of the alguacil declined to those of the secretaries and even of the alcaide who succeeded him as jailer his superior dignity however was recognized in a carta acordada of may thirteenth sixteen ten which provided that in public functions he should have precedence over the secretaries his long wand of office which exceeded that of secular alguaciles was also a distinction and when in fifteen seventy six the alguaciles of the santa cruzada in barcelona ventured to imitate him the suprema ordered the inquisitors to punish them his functions were various the inquisitors the receiver and the judge of confiscations were forbidden to appoint any one else to execute their orders if he were at hand if in his absence an arrest had to be made the fact had to be attested at the foot of the warrant issued to another without which the receiver was ordered not to pay the expenses incurred he made all levies and seizures and was entitled to fees for the service by the instructions of fourteen eighty eight if the duty was at a distance of more than three or four leagues he was not to be sent but a temporary substitute whose commission expired with the performance of the errand perhaps this was because the thrifty ferdinand had insisted that if he was sent out of the city he must pay his own expenses but this was relaxed for in fifteen o two we find the rule established that if an alguacil is sent from one province to another to a greater distance than four leagues his expenses were to be paid he had however to furnish at his own cost a satisfactory person to take charge of the prison during his absence and if he required assistance in making arrests the inquisitors selected the persons and determined their pay the alguacil mayor seems to have been an ornamental personage usually a man of distinction who thereby proclaimed his purity of blood and devotion to the faith we have seen that in seville and cordoba the office was hereditary in noble houses whose ancestors had abandoned to the inquisition royal castles of which they were alcaides receiving in return this position with handsome emoluments in sixteen fifty five the alguacil mayor of the tribunal of cordoba was luis mendez de aro conde duque of olivares and his deputy was gonzalo de cardenas y cordoba a knight of calatrava in seville don juan de saavedra y alvarado marquis of moscoso served as alguacil mayor at the auto de fe of march eleventh sixteen ninety one and november thirtieth sixteen ninety three about seventeen fifty the tribunal of seville had the marquis of villafranca as alguacil mayor that of valladolid had the marquis of revilla in granada the incumbent was a minor don nicolas Velázquez, and the office was served by don diego ramirez de la piscina the humbler officials of the tribunal were the nuncio the portero and the carcelero or alcaide de las carcelas secretas strictly speaking the nuncio was a messenger or courier bearing dispatches to the suprema or other tribunals and before the post office was organized his life must have been an active one in fifteen o two we hear of his salary being twelve hundred sueldos out of which he defrayed his travelling expenses but subsequently these were paid by the receiver and in fifteen forty one his stipend was five hundred sueldos his ayuda de costa in fifteen sixty seven was made dependent on his accompanying the inquisitors on their visitations at that period the tribunals seem to have been allowed two nuncios but with the development of postal facilities the functions of the position gradually shrank the number was cut down to one and in the eighteenth century we find him converted into a nuncio de camara or interior attendant called indifferently nuncio and portero while a nuncio extraordinario makes the fires and attends to other servile work the portero in the secular courts was a kind of apparitor to serve summonses authorized to take bail up to the sum of a hundred reales and forbidden to keep a shop or tavern in the inquisition his function was to serve citations notices of autos de fe decrees and other similar work and he was prohibited from engaging in trade of any kind he was not allowed to enter the audience chamber but in the eighteenth century we find him converted into a portero de camara or usher and janitor in which capacity he had entrance to the audience chamber when in seventeen ninety six we find a doctor don jose fontana serving as portero in the valencia tribunal we may infer that the office was not servile and it is observable that the portero and his wife are qualified as don and doña a title withheld from the nuncio and his spouse their salaries however were the same one thousand four hundred twenty reales when about seventeen ten porteros laid claim in public functions to seats on the banco de titulados the bench of commissioned officials their pretensions were rejected the jailer was necessary to a tribunal which had its special prison 
At first, as we have seen, the Alguacil had charge of this, and his employees were not reckoned among the officials. The first allusion to a carcelero that I have met occurs in 1499, when Juan de Moya is spoken of as the carcerarius of the Barcelona Tribunal. He must have been an exceptional official and a person of some consideration, for he was provided with a prebend. In 1515, Ferdinand deemed it advisable to put the prisons under control of the tribunals, with which view he empowered the inquisitors to appoint carceleros with salaries of five hundred sueldos. The jailer thus became a salaried official, entitled to all the privileges and immunities of this position, and gradually, toward the middle of the sixteenth century, the humble title of carcelero was exchanged for the more dignified one of alcaide de las carceles secretas. He was necessarily a person of confidence, responsible for the safe-keeping of prisoners and for their proper maintenance, functions which will be more conveniently treated when we come to consider the prison system. From the report of the Tribunal of Murcia in 1746, it appears that the salary then was 2,353 reales, in addition to which there was a jubilado alcaide with 330 reales. Possibly this habit of providing for supernumeraries explains why, in the table of officials, Toledo has four alcaides, and Lerena and Valencia have three each. In the early period, the carcelero sometimes served as torturer, but subsequently it became customary to employ the public executioner. The prison, sometimes crowded with inmates and exposed to insanitary conditions, rendered necessary an official physician, whose services were also indispensable in examinations before and after torture, and in the not infrequent cases of insanity, real or feigned as his duties called him within the sacred limits of the secreto he had to be a person of confidence sworn like all the rest to secrecy he was expected also to bestow gratuitous service on the officials and the suprema in the eighteenth century indulged itself in two at the fairly liberal salary of one thousand two hundred fifty eight reales apiece though they did not share in the extra emoluments so freely bestowed on other officials at first the appointment of physicians was not universal although the salary was inconsiderable, attributable, no doubt, to the fact that the physician was at liberty to continue his private practice. Thus, in 1486, Ferdinand designated ten libras as the pay of the physician of the Saragossa Tribunal, while there was none provided for that of Medina del Campo. The surgeon was rated at even less, for in 1510, one is furnished to Saragossa at a salary of five libras, and the same is paid to an apothecary who can scarce have furnished expensive drugs on such a stipend. The surgeon at this period was also a barber, and in 1502 a grant, once for all, of fifteen libras was made to Juan de Aguaviva, quote, cirujano y barbero, unquote, of Calatayud, for fourteen years curing and barbering the poor prisoners without salary or other advantage. By 1618, apparently, the professions had become distinct, for there is an order to pay Narciso Balie, surgeon, and Miguel Juan, barber, to the tribunal of Valencia. A chaplain was also a necessity, not for the prisoners who were denied the sacraments, but for the daily mass celebrated before commencing the work of the audience chamber. In 1572, a stipend of 7,500 marabedis is assigned for this, but in the 18th century, the Suprema paid the handsome salary of 5,500 reales. Confessors were also required for the penitential prison, and were called in to the secret prison for the moribund. There were also two personas honestas, or discreet persons, friars as a rule, whose duty it was to be present when witnesses ratified their testimony. In the earlier period these services were gratuitous, but, in the later time, there was a small payment which, in the case of a friar, would inure to his convent. An alcaide of the Casa de Penitencia, or penitential prison, was also a necessity during the period of active work although subsequently it was virtually a sinecure and in many tribunals was suppressed. We occasionally also meet with the office of proveedor, or purveyor of the secret prison, who seems to be identical with the dispensero, or steward. In the sixteenth century this official had a salary of two thousand marabedis, besides two marabedis a day for each prisoner and five blancas for cooking and washing. He was required to have honest weights, and not to charge more for food than it cost him. He kept an account with each prisoner and was paid out of the sequestrations. Locksmiths, masons, and other mechanics employed on the buildings were also sometimes reckoned as officials, for their duties in repairing their prisons were confidential. All tribunals, moreover, had from one to three abogados de presos, or advocates of prisoners, 
whose duties will claim consideration hereafter they were classified as salaried officials though sometimes they received a small stipend and sometimes none and they were allowed to serve other clients if they had any end of book four chapter two part four